Hi, I want to welcome you all here on behalf of the American Studies Program and our um, much appreciated co-funders. As I mentioned at the last American Studies talk, the American Studies yeah. Program always has co-funders and we always appreciate them. Uh, this time it's the Interdisciplinary Minors Program and the History Department. Um, our speaker today, Chris Oppie, uh, holds PhD in American Civilization from Harvard. He taught history at Harvard and at MIT, and he is the author of Working Class War, American Combat Soldiers in Vietnam. He's also the editor of a book entitled Cold War Constructions, The Political Culture of United States Imperialism. And it's in a series that he edits at the University of Massachusetts Press, an extremely innovative series um, called Culture, Politics, and the Cold War. His new book, which he's, uh, what, what he's here to talk about, is Patriots, the Vietnam War Remembered from All Sides, which will be published by Viking in May. Um, and it will be a selection of the Book of the Month Club, a selection of the Military Book of the Month Club, uh, alternate selection of the History Book Club. Is that right? Um, uh, and lots of other things like that, uh, which indicate that it's going to be very widely received and reviewed and discussed. I will just um, uh, read one comment from uh, Studs Terkel, uh, one of our most distinguished writers of humane history based on interviews, um, who I think sums up the sort of the powerful expectations surrounding this book. He says, of all the works on the Vietnam War, fiction and nonfiction, this is the big one. Witness is born from all sides, theirs and ours, the soldiers, the resistors, and the armchair warriors. Christian Oppie has come through with the book that was waiting to be written. Um, please join me in welcoming Chris Oppie to BC. Thank you, Carlo, and thank you all for coming. About five years ago, I began traveling the United States uh, and Vietnam to interview people from all sides of a war that pitted the two nations against each other, created bitter hostilities within both, aroused global alarm, and unleashed the most costly and ruinous destruction of any conflict since the Second World War. Eventually, I interviewed some 350 people from that work comes Patriots, the Vietnam War Remembered from All Sides. It includes the accounts of 135 people, Vietnamese and Americans, men and women, former soldiers and civilians. We hear from grunts and guerrillas, generals and pilots, policymakers and diplomats, doctors and nurses, journalists and poets, anti-war activists and exiles, CIA agents and draft counselors, POWs and refugees. Some are well known, for example, General William Westmoreland and General Vo Nguyen Jap, President Lyndon Johnson's National Security Advisor Walt Rostow, Pentagon analyst turned anti-war activist Daniel Ellsberg, Nixon Chief of Staff Alexander Haig, Senator and former Prisoner of War, John McCain, filmmaker Oliver Stone, civil rights leader Julian Bond, and novelist Tim O'Brien. But the book is mostly comprised of uh, people whose names and experiences are unfamiliar. I began the book with the awareness that this was really the last opportunity to do such a project, that there was an older generation of people connected to the war that was rapidly dying off. At least five people who I interviewed for this book uh, died while the book was being completed, and several others uh, died before I could meet them. It was not only the last possible time to do a comprehensive oral history of the Vietnam War, it was also in some ways the first possible time. Only in the last decade have American scholars and journalists had sufficient permission to do interviews of this kind in Vietnam. In part, that's because the United States and Vietnam had no diplomatic relations until 1994. But it's also because Vietnam's one-party state placed serious restrictions on writers, their own as well as foreigners. There is still no genuine freedom of speech in Vietnam. But I found people much more open and candid than I had um, anticipated. <laughs> 
I was also amazed by how vivid 30 and 40 year old memories have remained and by how willing most people were to explore them anew. Of course, memory is selective, partial, and sometimes faulty, and we should not suspend our critical faculties in evaluating oral history, just as we should not assume that presidential speeches or New York Times articles are literal and objective representations of historical reality. Yet oral history remains one of the best tools we have to gain access to the human experience of the past, to see, hear, and feel what history meant to a wide variety of historical actors. I was drawn to this work for many reasons, but one key impulse grew out of my experience of teaching courses on modern US history at Harvard and MIT. For years, most of my students came to my classes with only a few images of the Vietnam War in their heads, almost uh, all of them drawn from a few Hollywood movies that told almost nothing about how the war began, why it bred so much dissent, or why it lasted so long. American popular culture has offered us an oddly diminished view of a vast history, a war that might have inspired epic films and novels with scores of characters from all sides and ranks, spanning decades and continents, has typically been reduced to stories about small units of American infantrymen fighting a silent, nearly invisible enemy at a single moment in time. Not only are the Vietnamese routinely left out, but most of the Americans who made Vietnam the contentious experience it was is also missing. Why that is uh, might be the subject of another lecture entirely, but my brief answer is that the ways we have chosen to remember and forget the Vietnam War have allowed us to avoid a full reckoning of the war's costs and consequences. Even when we believe we have confronted the war's worst horrors, often enough we have only engaged in a kind of self-directed therapy, often casting the war as an American tragedy, as, it, as if it had been a faded imposition afflicting only us. Let me offer a brief list of facts about the war that strike me as conspicuously absent from common public memory of the war and yet are crucial to understanding some of the testimonies I present uh, in Patriots. We should know that the United States supported the French reconquest of Vietnam after World War II, that the French war to maintain its colony led to an eight-year war, largely bankrolled by the United States, that culminated in the French defeat in 1954 in a French defeat in 1954, that from 1954 to 1975, the US waged a 21-year long military campaign to build and sustain a permanent non-communist nation called South Vietnam that was ruled by a string of regimes so unpopular that any one of them would have collapsed without massive American support. <coughs> that South Vietnam, in fact, would not have existed without US intervention. According to the terms of the Geneva Accords of 1954 that ended the French Indochina War, Vietnam was to be divided between North and South only temporarily until 1956 when nationwide elections were to be held to unify the nation under a single government. The United States and the South Vietnamese regime it was supporting decided not to hold those promised elections and to root out and destroy all Southern Vietnamese who had supported the communist-led resistance against French rule. We should also know that the American-backed regime in Saigon was opposed not only by communist North Vietnam, but also by millions of South Vietnamese who allied themselves with the North and who supported the Southern guerrillas known to Americans as the Viet Cong that in the course of this two-decade war, the United States dropped more bombs on Vietnam than have been dropped on any country in history, that 80% of those bombs were dropped on South Vietnam, the country we claim to be saving from external aggression, that American bombing, shelling, and search-and-destroy missions killed hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese civilians, 
and destroyed more than half of all South Vietnamese villages. That U.S. policies designed to separate civilians from pro-communist guerrillas resulted in the forced relocation of at least 5 million South Vietnamese out of a population of some 17 million. And that at war's end in 1975, the communist victors imprisoned hundreds of thousands of South Vietnamese who had fought alongside the Americans. And in the years that followed, more than a million fled the country, perhaps as many as 50,000 of those who escaped in small boats died at sea, almost equivalent to the number of American soldiers who died in the war. That large framework opens up quite readily when you begin to talk with the widest possible variety of historical actors. For the Vietnamese who fought the United States, the Vietnam War was not a single event, but a long chain of wars for independence against foreign enemies stretching back two millennia. For more than a 1,000 years, they fought intermittent wars against the Chinese. For 100 years, they struggled against French colonial rule. So for many Vietnamese, the war against the United States was perceived as a direct outgrowth of this historic quest for national unification and independence. And indeed, what we call the Vietnam War is known in Vietnam as the American War. How else could they distinguish it from their other wars? The remarkable nature of that history came home to me in an especially powerful way one day while riding in a taxi along a busy street in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, formerly Saigon. I was riding uh, with uh, Hong Kong Thuy, who served as a translator uh, for many of my interviews in Vietnam. Uh, like many Vietnamese, Thuy has a deep historical consciousness, but with me, he talked mostly about his children, his love of music, almost anything but his childhood memories of the war. I only found out after days being with him that he had lost two relatives uh, during this, the uh, notorious Christmas bombing of 1972. So I was somewhat taken aback when out of the blue in the taxi, Thuy said, do you realize that Vietnam is the only nation on earth that has defeated three out of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council? I had to concede that this had not occurred to me, but in fact, the Vietnamese did drive China, France, and the United States from their land. Hearing Thuy's question made me feel for the first time that I was not in some small, faraway country on the other side of the world, but at an epicenter of global conflict among a people whose historical consciousness stretches back centuries beyond that of most Americans. When I asked Vietnamese to tell me about their experience of the American War, they typically began by describing their experience during the French War. Again and again, I was staggered by the sheer length and unremitting presence of war in Vietnamese lives. I interviewed one man who left his home in southern Vietnam to fight the French in 1946 and did not return home until the American War ended in 1975. He said, I was away from home for 29 years. When I entered the house, I saw my older sister and mistook her for my mother. When my mother came in, she didn't recognize me. She insisted on examining my head to find a familiar mole. When she found it, she cried out, it's you, it's you. And many of his nieces and nephews had not even been told that he existed because that knowledge might endanger the family since people in South Vietnam were constantly interrogated about whether they had relatives fighting for the communists. It was safer for them not to know. Most Americans, by contrast, did not become fully aware of their nation's involvement in Vietnam until about the mid-60s. It felt to many as if we were entering a war in progress, the origins of which seemed murky and mysterious. Even people who understood that the roots of American intervention in Vietnam stretched back at least as far as the early 1950s were unable to identify or agree upon a decisive starting point. There was no initial invasion or battle to mark the outbreak of hostilities, no home front mobilization, no presidential announcement that the war had officially begun, and of course, no congressional declaration of war. <clears throat> 
Americans entered Vietnam both literally and figuratively at different points in time, swept along by a history that had been going on long enough to seem almost inevitable, if not unstoppable. Grasping when and how it all began was almost as, pre as elusive as predicting when and how it would end. If you had begun college uh, when I did in 1973, you would have, um, the war would have been daily news since at least 1965 when you would have been in the fifth grade. During all those years, you would have grown accustomed to seeing television news reports announcing weekly body counts of several hundred American dead and several thousand Vietnamese. It was probably around 1972, at age 17, when I learned for the first time that we had been supporting the government of South Vietnam since the year before my birth, 1954. Let me tell you a bit about uh, one Vietnamese man, Ngo Vinh Long, now an American, who was born in 1943 in the Mekong Delta of southern Vietnam. Throughout my childhood, Long says, the French made routine patrols and killed a lot of Vietnamese. They dumped the bodies into the river and the currents carried them into lakes and ponds. Every time I went down to the pond, I would see floating corpses. I hated the French. By contrast, Long grew up loving everything he had heard about the United States. The Vietnamese, he recalls, had two names for the United States. Mi Quoc, which means beautiful country, and Hep Chung Qua Qua Ki, which means racially harmonious country. Having grown up with the French, who treated the Vietnamese like dirt, I was extremely impressed by these images of the United States. When my father first tried to teach me French, I refused. Excuse me. I said I wanted to study the language of that beautiful country, the United States. In 1949, when I was just six, my father and I walked all the way from Vinh Long province to Saigon to find some books in English. It was a journey of 100 miles. They bought a copy of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens and Long taught himself English by translating it into Vietnamese, actually via a French dictionary, because they couldn't find an English dictionary, and memorizing it word by word, sentence by sentence. But gradually, Long's father changed his view of the United States. He told Long that the US was supporting France and would eventually replace the French. I said, Dad, you've been telling me that, the Ameri that, that America is this beautiful, wonderful country where there's racial harmony. Why are you bad-mouthing them now? He said, well, it's not the American people. It's the policy of the American government. I didn't understand any of it. By the late 1950s, Long had excelled at school, and even at age 16 was, in, was invited to the capital city of Saigon to tutor the children of many rich and well-known South Vietnamese families. He also began to meet many Americans. This is now the late 50s. I got invitations to tea at the US Embassy and the Cirque Sportif, the most exclusive country club. It felt like one big party. I was given free Coca-Cola, and to me, that was like a symbol of civilization. People were dressed in white suits and white tennis outfits. I met generals and ambassadors and young American girls talked with me about dating in the United States. They asked me whether I went parking, and I didn't know what the hell that was. They thought I was cute. Eventually, an American general hired Long to help prepare maps of the South Vietnamese countryside, which would later be used by the American military. Wherever we went, people were suspicious. Some of them said, if they're making maps, they're preparing for war. I said, well, maybe. But if they have good detailed maps, then they're not going to bomb or shell innocent civilians. So what's wrong with that? I knew that America was behind the war, but I liked the American presence. I thought the United States was doing this for the good of Vietnam, that the US stood for freedom and democracy. However, his experiences in the countryside with the map making team completely undermined his faith in US intervention. First, it became quite obvious that the American backed government under No Din Diem had very little popular support. Ziem was a Catholic in an overwhelmingly Buddhist country. 
His autocratic government dispensed privileges and positions to a tight circle of family members and co-religionists and repressed all dissent with an iron fist, especially after 1959 when Ziem decreed a particularly draconian new law in which anyone suspected of threatening the security of the state could be sentenced to death by roving military tribunals with no right to appeal. As Long recalled, the Ziem government had many public ex executions. A lot of people in the West denied that it happened, but Ziem made no bones about it. They advertised the executions, and there were pictures in the paper of people getting their heads chopped off by a guillotine. Officials read a list of crimes the person was supposed to have committed, the blade came down, the head rolled into a box full of sawdust, and that was that. The whole thing was meant to intimidate the population not to join the revolution against the M. In 1959, when I went around with the MAP teams, there were many military outposts where they summarily chopped off the heads of people they thought were communist. They put the heads on stakes right in front of their outposts, sometimes with two cigarettes up the nostrils. They even invited people to take pictures of it. They were very proud of themselves. Long also discovered that U.S. policy in the countryside was destroying traditional peasant life by moving people off their land and into strategic hamlets that were surrounded by barbed wire, fences, moats, and spikes designed to separate the, civilians, the civilian population from the communist guerrillas. It simply served to turn the people ever more against the government and toward the communists. Long came upon one strategic hamlet where the where the peasants were literally starving to death. After several years of seeing what American policy was doing in the countryside, he resigned his map-making job and turned decisively against the American-backed war. He joined the Saigon Student Union and began participating in demonstrations against U.S. intervention. After several arrests, friends advised him to take advantage of his academic gifts and accept an offer to go to Harvard. He did, and has been in this country ever since. While at Harvard in the mid-60s, Long had an individual tutorial with a professor named Henry Kissinger, who would soon become national security advisor to President Richard Nixon, and, of course, a key architect of the final years of the American War. I tried to prove to him that the United States could only win the war by destroying Vietnam, and they shouldn't do it. Kissinger said, Long, you are really naive. Every country, like every human, has a breaking point, Vietnam included. Of course, millions of South Vietnamese continued to work and fight for the Saigon government. Most were drafted and had no choice but to fight. Yet a considerable number were fervently anti-communist and regarded themselves as true patriots. Even so, many South Vietnamese soldiers were disdainful of their own generals and government, regarding them as riddled with corruption, devoted primarily to self-preservation, and lacking the widespread support of their own people. Moreover, the, the more tr troops the United States sent to the war, the harder it was for South Vietnamese forces to make the case that they, not the communists, represented the authentic and patriotic cause of Vietnamese self-determination. So long as their fate was linked to a foreign power, the South Vietnamese troops could be effectively denounced by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese as lackeys, henchmen, and puppets of the Americans. As one former South Vietnamese soldier, now a neighbor of mine, put it, when the United States decided to land foot soldiers in Vietnam, it put the South Vietnamese at a political disadvantage the North was able to mobilize Southerners as well as Northerners to fight what they call the American invasion. All of our history has taught children that you have to be courageous enough to fight foreign aggressors. We could not tell our brothers and sisters that we were fighting for ourselves as long as American soldiers were in the country fighting for us. We said we were fighting to save the country from communism, but that was too abstract. And people could say that, well, at least the communists are Vietnamese. And what of the Americans in Vietnam? 
What I found in so many cases, whether talking with former infantrymen, officers, diplomats, journalists, nurses, was that at the most basic level, the great majority of them just did not feel that the American cause in Vietnam could elicit their unequivocal devotion. At the very least, they found it confusing and contradictory. And as the war went on, more and more of them found it utterly bankrupt of moral integrity. Whatever else we may want to say about how the Americans fought, how much they sacrificed, how deeply they cared about their comrades, they just could not feel like they were the good guys in Vietnam. Even commanding officers often found little to uphold. When I interviewed retired generals, I sometimes asked them what they were proudest of in their Vietnamese experience. They might mention an operation where they'd killed a great many Vietnamese, or uh, an operation that led to the capture of a lot of weapons or enemy documents, or sometimes they, they'd say that they were proud that they had done their best to protect uh, the lives of their own men. But not one of them told me their pride came from serving a, a noble cause. Indeed, quite often they contrasted the iron will of their enemy to their own forces relative lack of a motivating cause. As Marine General Charles Cooper put it, we used to say, their guys just care more. Whatever motivates them, or whatever they feed them, or whatever they believe in, whether it's getting rid of the Europeans or all this communist pap, they believe it. They were totally unselfish. Another American general said, I'm not sure why the US made such a tremendous effort. The announced reasons didn't wash. What were, what were we really trying to do? Whose bacon were we really trying to save? I keep asking myself. Even General William Westmoreland, the four-star general who commanded US forces in Vietnam from 1964 to 1968, told me, I was leading an unpopular war, the most unpopular war we've ever gotten involved in. Our national security was not in jeopardy and therefore the American public was not totally with it. One of the reasons many veterans, American veterans, feel terribly betrayed by the experience of Vietnam stems from the fact that they entered the service with an almost total faith that they were not only doing their duty, but that their government would not send them to war if it wasn't for the good of the nation. As one of them said to me, growing up, I didn't know there was a bad war. Jim Sular grew up in northern Minnesota, where all the men in his family worked in the mines of the Mesabi Iron Range. Oh, he, he started junior college in 1965, but he soon quit to work in the mines. I knew when I quit college I'd lose my student deferment and get drafted. I had no problem with that because I was a patriot. I believed in the flag. I believed in serving my country, and I was good at it. He became a flight engineer on the enormous double-rotored uh, Chinook helicopter. As flight engineer, I was in charge of a $1.5 million helicopter. I took care of all the maintenance, all the records. It was my ship. It didn't fly unless I said it was ready to. There was something grand about that for a 19-year-old specialist E-4. And I loved war. I can't deny that. I loved it. I hate it now, but at the time as a kid, I loved it. I mean, I just loved flying. Every time those turbines started winding up, I just thought, yeah. I loved being on an M60 machine gun, banging away with that thing. God, there was nothing like a combat assault when you went in with 20, 30, 40 choppers. Just that energy. It was an adrenaline rush. Most of the time, we supplied fire bases or put in American troops and took them out. I'll tell you one story that has always stuck, stuck with me. It was up around Kantum. The jungle was just fierce up there, incredibly dense and menacing. We were going in to extract a platoon. They had to blow a hole in the jungle for us to get in, and there was barely enough room. It was like dropping down a tunnel. It got darker and darker. As we dropped down in there, these guys started materializing out of the jungle. 
They'd been out so long, their fatigues were rotting off. I'll never forget this one guy. He came on board, and he had about four or five scalps hanging from his belt. Every now and then, you'd see a guy with a string of ears, but I'd never seen scalps before. These were bad-looking dudes, but I could tell they were just young guys like us. We also moved Vietnamese villagers. A lot of times, areas that were considered to be in the hands of the Viet Cong were declared free fire zones. We would go in and tell the villagers that they've got to get out, that after a certain date, they would be considered VC, and anybody we see, we can kill. On one mission where we were depopulating a village, we packed about 60 people into my Chinook. They'd never been near this kind of machine and were really scared, but they didn't have a choice. We got them all in and had them squatting. There were only four of us with about 60 of them. We started lifting off, and one of the Vietnamese in the back stood up and freaked out. I couldn't get to him because all the people were between me and him. We were probably 60 feet off the ground, and our crew chief in the back just thought, well, fuck it, you're out of here, and pitched the man out the back. I'm sure he was killed, but we never heard anything about it. There was never any follow-up. Even at that time, I felt within myself that the forced dislocation of these people was a real tragedy. We didn't understand that their ancestors were buried there, that it was very important to their culture and religion to be with their ancestors. I could see the terror in their faces. They were defecating and urinating and completely freaked out. It was horrible. I've always considered myself a good soldier, whatever that means. I did what I was told to do. But everything I'd been raised to believe in was contrary to what I saw in Vietnam. A day doesn't go by that I don't think about Vietnam. Not just what happened to Americans, but what we did to Vietnam. If circumstances had been different, we might have learned so much from them instead of learning nothing and doing so much damage. One of the things I've learned from the Vietnamese who fought on the other side against the Americans were some answers to the question that haunted so many U.S. policymakers, namely, why their Vietnamese opponents were able and willing to fight so hard at such enormous cost, why they did not seem to have a breaking point that Henry Kissinger had predicted. Part of the answer is that there was truly a deep and patriotic commitment to Vietnamese self-determination. The guiding spirit of this faith among North Vietnamese and their southern allies was Ho Chi Minh, the founder of the Vietnamese Communist Party and the president of North Vietnam. Ho was a devout communist, but also a fervent nationalist. Many Vietnamese regarded Uncle Ho as the father of their country. His most famous slogan had the broadest possible appeal. Nothing is more precious, he said, than our freedom and independence. For people who had suffered the indignities of foreign rule, these words had a resonance that is hard to exaggerate. Even so, many Vietnamese believed the American, um, however many Vietnamese believed the American war to be a sacred cause, that alone doesn't fully explain the years of struggle and sacrifice. In one interview after another, it was clear that virtually everyone had a more personal motive for fighting. Often they had lost a friend or relative. Indeed, America's war brought so much devastation to Vietnam, in many ways, the more we fought, the more motivated the other side became to fight against us. A considerable number of Vietnamese women fought for the Viet Cong, and I want to tell you about one of them. Her name is Nguyen Thi Gung, G-U-N-G. She's a petite woman whose given name means ginger. And when I talked with her in Vietnam, she barely filled up half a chair, and her toes just barely reached the floor. She grew up in Ku Chi, just 25 miles from Saigon. It was a, Ku Chi was a center of resistance to the French and then against the United States and the American-backed government in South Vietnam. She was a Viet Cong guerrilla one of the Southern revolutionaries who fought in alliance with the North Vietnamese communists. Ku Chi was also notorious as a place where the Viet Cong had built hundreds 
of miles of underground tunnels where they hid, slept, planned attacks, stored ammunition, uh, and even uh, treated people in underground hospitals. Today, if you uh, visit Vietnam, the tunnels of Cú Chi are a major tourist destination. You can get a tour and actually crawl through some of the tunnels, and they have been widened to accommodate Western bodies like mine. But uh, even so, I can tell you that they are really just unimaginably claustrophobic and just really um, impossible to imagine how people could have spent so much of their lives sleeping, uh, living, and fighting out of those tunnels. Wen Ti Gung lived and fought in the jungles and tunnels of Ku Chi for more than a decade. When the revolution broke out, I was just a kid. In 1962, the puppet soldiers came to my house and said, your father was a Viet Cong, so we killed him. Go fetch his body. He had gone to a meeting with his comrades. The southern soldiers surrounded the building and killed everyone. From then on, I decided to take revenge for my father's death. Also, the people in my neighborhood suffered from poverty and deprivation and were always brutalized by the police and puppet soldiers. I wanted to do something to liberate my country and help people get enough food and clothing. I believe my mission in life was to continue my father's cause. So in 1963, when I was 17, I joined the guerrillas. A few years later, she fought for the first time against American troops from trenches they called anti-American belts. We knew the Americans were unfamiliar with the area, but I felt very scared and very nervous because I was just a small girl and the Americans were so big. We couldn't shoot them from a distance. We had to wait for them to come very close. As soon as I started to fire, I killed an American. After he fell, some of his friends came rushing to his aid. They held his body and cried. They cried a lot. This made them sitting ducks, very easy to shoot. From then on, we knew that if we just shot one American soldier, others would rush to him, and then we could shoot many more. After a few minutes, they pulled back, taking the bodies of their friends with them, but they didn't pick up all their rifles, so I crawled out and grabbed five or six. In that first battle against the Americans, I shot so many GIs, I was awarded a decoration with the title Valiant Destroyer of American Infantrymen. If uh, that seems a little jarring to your ears, uh, consider these words from a former American infantryman of the 1st Cavalry. Quote, once I got a three-day in-country R&R at China Beach for killing the most gooks in a month, everybody sort of kept track. I had like 15 confirmed. Gung goes on to say, American shells and bombs were extremely powerful, and sometimes they killed people in, tu in the tunnels, but it didn't happen as often as you might think. The Kuchi tunnels had such small openings, it was very rare for a shell or bomb to land right in a tunnel. As Uncle Ho said, a stork can't shit into a bottle, so with our tunnels, we shouldn't be scared of American bombers. Gung was often assigned the incredibly dangerous mission of sneaking onto enemy bases in the middle of the night to help draw reconnaissance maps and plan future attacks. One mission was so perilous, her commander, anticipating that she would be killed, decided to conduct a ceremony for her in advance of the operation. She says, it was called a funeral mass for the living but was exactly like a funeral mass for the dead. They read the entire funeral oration in my presence. They recited my full name, my birth date, and recounted my achievements in the war. They talked about how sad they were that I had been killed in action. They spoke exactly as if I were already dead. At the end of the interview, Gung said, whenever anyone asks me about the suffering of the war, I have a terrible nightmare that very night in which I relive these experiences. I miss my comrades very much and often see them again in my dreams. But I never felt guilty about the killing I did. It was war. Wouldn't you shoot me if you saw me holding a weapon and pointing it at you? I think it was justified. 
But if I went to America and killed people there, I would feel very sorry and guilty. Since the Americans came to my country, I don't feel guilty. Listening to, to Gung, you might well imagine that she and many Vietnamese remain deeply hostile toward Americans. But in fact, every American I've talked to who has visited Vietnam over the past 10 years has reported being welcomed with remarkable um, warmth and acceptance, a friendliness that Americans invariably find surprising and somewhat inexplicable. The desire to make peace with former enemies has deep roots in Vietnamese history and culture, and there was, even during the American War, a powerful Vietnamese conviction that their real enemies were not the ordinary American soldiers, but the American government uh, who made the policies. In my interviews with most veterans on both sides, there is a deep and moving desire for reconciliation uh, with their former enemies. They offer us no easy endings or simple sets of lessons learned, but rather unflinching visions of how entwined our histories have been and how dependent we are on each other if we truly care to explore them further. I'll close now, as my book does, with a poem written by a Vietnamese man who visited the United States in 1995 he went to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. to pay his respects to his former enemy. He sat down, wrote a poem in English, and left it at the base of the wall. It's called At the Vietnam Wall. Because I never knew you, nor did you me, I come. Because you left behind mother, father, and betrothed, and I, wife and children, I come. Because love is stronger than enmity and can bridge oceans, I come. Because you never return and I do, I come. Thank you. <laughs>